I had been reading St. John of the Cross, The Dark Night of the Soul, and of course, uh, a great mystic. And I thought of St. John of the Cross in a Catalan landscape, and what I used in the background here is actually an Icelandic landscape. I painted for three weeks in Iceland, uh, and this is in Freydavatn, is a, a volcanic district. The painting itself is hardly bigger than this, but that formed the basis of uh, uh, how I can see the background of this painting. And this painting was called St. John of the Cross until the day I brought all the canvases here and hung the show. Brother Thomas, a Franciscan monk associated uh, with the college, uh, came in and he said, oh, St. Francis praying on, uh, Monte Della, on the Monte della Verna, which is two years before he died and received the stigmata. And I thought to myself, oh, my goodness, here I have given a title to this painting. This shows how unnarrative I am in the approach to the painting. I've given a title because I'm reading St. John of the Cross, but Norman Ader, who was Franciscan, you might say, sympathy to the core, yes, this is, this is what the title is, and I changed the title. How to put a lifetime's work into one minute. I approach the work directly from the nature. This in itself, the degree of time spent, I mean, perhaps 100 sittings, 60 to 100 sittings for any one of these paintings, it, with the nature present, not copying the nature, but working from it. Uh, that already places it in a different category from anything in the past, in the Renaissance, for example, or the 17th century or the 19th century. Uh, this concentration on the specifics of the actual subject. It begins with a finder. How high for how wide? The first four lines of the composition. And in the drawing process, uh, as I have taught for years, you set up the big design in terms of a four or five or six big shapes, cutting out to the edge, which you can see clearly, I think, in this painting. Uh, how far down do you go? How far? Uh, are things, and then how high for how wide is matched by what is the, what is the uh, posture, what is the direction, and that's where the plumb line comes in, if I can untangle this. The plumb line is basically a thread with a nail on it. It's the world vertical. It's gravity. Matisse said it took him three years to build it into his eye. It's what enabled Martha Graham to say, either your leg is parallel to the floor or it isn't. Building this into the eye, I've never found a student that uh, did it much less than three years. And it, everything has posture. Clouds have posture. This has posture. Human beings have posture. Rocks have posture. Trees have posture. Everything has posture. How far, by how much, downhill to the right or downhill to the left of the world vertical? To build that into your eye is really a, an extraordinary process. Uh, and I think uh, I can safely say that I have not had in 45 years of active teaching a single student come into my class with the faintest conception as to how to handle the plum, how to use the plum, not to copy like a monkey, but to build it uh, into yourself so that you can see uh, that although we are in a room with verticals and horizontals, they are not visually vertical and horizontal. So this training is behind all of this, and in terms of color, I do what Alvin Nikolai uh, said, you must divorce yourself from yourself. You've got to get all of your preconceptions of, of, uh, out of your head. Of color, for instance, to take an example, if you look under my chin, what is the color value? Your preconception is if I'm Caucasian, I'm pink and white. But that isn't pink and white. It's more like the uh, weather shingles on a roof. The preconceptions, our own and others, the emotionalism, the intellectualism, the storytelling, all of the garbage that we bring in when we use our eyes get in the way and prevent you from using your own eye and see. You will copy somebody else's style, you will copy somebody else's manner, but you won't see. So these are abstractions, do you see? 
in the Latin sense of the word, abtraho, drawn from the relationship of how light for how dark, how warm for how cool. And because they're taken from a particular model, they bring all kinds of designs within designs within designs. So that the person looking at it, whether they're aware of all of this or not, is responding immediately and tangibly to an energy, do you see, that comes out of the subject. And what this says about the subject and its relationship to 20th century art is, uh, it seems to me, pretty important. This is going at, if, you, or if I may say, reintroducing the subject uh, into painting in a completely contemporary 20th century immediate way, or 21st century way now, based on the looking. But is it all looking? Of course not. I can do and have done here something that no camera can do. What happens when an object is closer to you uh, as you can, you can always see, like this, if I, if I put my hand up and you take my hand against my head, the hand will seem larger than the head. So what I do is to make an anatomically functional figure that can get up and move and walk. And if you look at any of these figures, they, can, uh, they are not locked into the, their position. They can exist at, as anatomically uh, workable, moving figures. It means that I have to make what's near, what the eye sees is closer, smaller, and what's further away, larger. And one of the reasons I love to work life size is because we identify on the life size, and you can't cheat. You can cheat like mad when you're working under life, and uh, you're inventing when you're working over life. But when you're working at approximately the life size scale, there you've got the whole thing, and if you miss, by so much as a sixteenth of an inch, one hand is bigger than the other, or one foot is, is, is one leg is larger than the other, or something, one eye, I mean, even in here, that eye will have been made larger than it appears, than this, you know, because it sits back. And that's what communicates the sense of form in space. And think 20th century painting again, and think of uh, uh, Stella's search for flatness. This is bringing in uh, dimension and subject matter into painting in a completely contemporary way. And uh, uh, as, as Stella and uh, Ellsworth Kelly and the others, no more concerned for the subjective interference. Again, Nikolai, divorce yourself from yourself. Okay. Now, how's that for a speech? When you have the first four lines, do you see? that you set up arcs and angles that continue outside the picture. I mean, you, you get it in all of these. I mean, for instance, here, here you have an arc that projects itself as a segment of an arc that would continue out, or the same down in here. Do you see? That is a, a, an arc that implies more. And I've, uh, I've noticed this, that it, that it carries the abstraction, the sense of the, of the composition. It helps to detach from the what it is, and it gives you something larger that go, extends beyond the, the border of the picture itself. It isn't what you see with so much beginning uh, art or uncomposed art. They don't know what to do with the corner, oh dear, oh alas. Uh, Stella talks about that. They don't know. Uh, how to compose. And this makes it very, very abstract, you see. It's not Renaissance painting again, in which you do a figure and you put it into a corner or, a, or the center or wherever it is. And it's beautiful and it's made to stay where it is and it can't get up and move around. I'm not interested in that. So that's again really, really uh, contemporary, opening up all kinds of aspects of, of gestures through the specific designs within the design rather than work that's been done out of the head following a pattern book, for instance, the way Anger and, and uh, Degas followed uh, pattern books and developed and worked from them. They start with the art, I start with the life.